Hi, I'm Ashley Ford, and this is 112BK. Coming up... White, straight men my age, the whole world was handed to them. Handed to them. I mean, I used to say, if you're a straight, white, Gentile man, and you're not the President of the United States, you have failed. <laughs> That's how easy life is for those guys. Fran Lebowitz is one of my literary heroes. And it's not an overstatement to say some of her writing and social commentary have literally changed my life. She's a New York City institution, and she's got the gift for gab. And we gabbed recently by phone about issues large and small, like riding the subway, technology, and her prediction that Trump would never win the White House. Here's that conversation. Fran, thank you so much for talking with me today. You're welcome. I wanted to start by telling you, you know, I'm a native Hoosier, Indiana person. I moved here five years ago to New York, and I moved here for a writing job. And I've got to tell you, since coming to New York, I think I've done less writing than when I lived in Indiana. Do you think New York is still a place that can foster artists a certain kind of way? You know, it depends what you mean by that. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's psychotically expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's stupidly expensive. But I always point out to people who are younger than me, and that is pretty much everyone now, <laughs> um, that, you know, I came to New York in 1970, mm -hmm. um, and or maybe 69, I can never remember. But, <clears throat> you know, and they always say New York was going bankrupt, which I guess is true, although I didn't really notice it, because if you have zero money, the city going bankrupt is not of interest to you. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and New York was always more expensive than any other place. Mm. You know, I, I don't know what it, well, you know, what Indiana cost in 1970, but I guarantee you it was a lot less than what New York cost in 1970. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. So when I tell people how much my first apartment costs, they're, like, laughing. Like, you know, that's what costs now practically, you know, to have a hamburger. It mm -hmm. was a lot easier um, to come to New York to be a writer, an artist. Mm -hmm. um, it absolutely was, first of all. Um, uh, you, there were tons of places in New York that it was very relatively cheap to live. Mm -hmm. The other thing that no one seems to n remember is we didn't really care how we lived. Mm. And one thing I've noticed about people who are young, they have very high expectations of material comfort. Oh, you yeah. know, we lived horribly. I mean, I want to point out that, you know, these cheap apartments were horrible. Okay? <laughs> it's not like they were cheap, great apartments. Or, you know, there's almost no such thing. Right. So we lived horribly. You know, I had I lived in an apartment for nine years that almost never had heat. Wow. Almost never had heat. Um, and we had actually a lot more winter than we have now. Mm -hmm. um, so that we lived horribly. We didn't really care that much. I suppose if someone said, no question, if someone said, would you like to have a nice apartment? I would have said yes. <laughs> but no one was asking. Right. Um, and so, and I also think that in the kind of terrible conditions we lived in were actually helpful um, in the sense that, that's what pushed us out of the house. Mm. You know, so we had this incredibly, um, you know, interesting public lives. I don't mean public in the sense that people now mean it. I don't mean famous lives. Right. Um, because no one wanted to stay in these horrible apartments. Right. You know, they were just awful. So um, that's why you went out into the street. Yeah, we went out. We were out all the time. And the street was a lot different than it is now. That's absolutely true. Right. You know, I mean, there was a street. <laughs> you know, uh, yes, New York is absolutely... Right. Worse than it used to be from that point of view, mm -hmm. um, but still better than Indiana. When somebody tells you that they're from places like this, like Indiana, um, do you ever think, uh, I don't know if you're going to make it here? <laughs> no. Quite the opposite, by the way. Mm. I mean, it is my observation uh, that people from out of New York, outside of New York, uh, very often do better in New York than people from New York. And one mm. of the reasons, I think, is that... I mean, I was from New Jersey, which people who, from places like in Indiana would say, oh, it's the same thing. It is not the same thing. No. <laughs> it's New Jersey, not Indiana, but it's also not New York. Right. Um, one of the things that I think helps you if you're from out of town is you don't have any idea how hard New York is. The naivete that you have, you know, is mm. helpful to you. Because if you, when people really, in, in other words, if you're going to climb a mountain, it's better to think it's a little hill. Mm-hmm. I think. You know, um, but, you know, of course, you know, cities that become stupidly expensive um, mm. and that attract, uh, then they start attracting a, a worse kind of person. In other words, you know, in the 70s, uh, people who belonged in the suburbs moved to the suburbs. Right. Now they come here 
mm-hmm. because it's cleaner and it's safer and it's, you know. Um, that, for instance, there didn't used to be all these children in New York. I can <laughs> promise you that. You know, I mean, there were, of course, were children in New York. They're everywhere. But, uh, I live in Brooklyn. They're everywhere. Yeah, but they're, they're not just in Brooklyn, okay? <laughs> they're everywhere. And when, you know, it used to be that, I mean, in my lifetime, not before my lifetime, which there was such a time, um, that wasn't the case. But in my lifetime, uh, my, my young life, um, basically, the kinds of people in New York who had children, you know, certainly, you know, more than one, but even any, um, were poor people and rich people. Mm. So you didn't have, I know this is a horrible thing to say now because all these terms have changed, you didn't have what we used to call this middle-class sensibility, which used to be a bad thing. Now it's considered to be a wonderful thing. And the reason it's considered to be a wonderful thing now is there is no middle class anymore. Yep. So <clears throat> uh, you didn't have that. You know, that's what we were escaping from. And I didn't mean from a point of view of money, mm-hmm. but from a point of view of sensibility. Mm. Um, that sensibility was not in New York. Right. You know, there weren't all these children. There weren't all these dogs. Right. You know, I mean, there were there, there. What you see now in New York City, a lot in certain uh, neighborhoods, in a lot of neighborhoods in Manhattan, and a lot of neighborhoods in Brooklyn, mm-hmm. and I'm sure in other places that I don't have to go to, um, <laughs> you see this kind of suburban life being lived at one million times the price. Yes. And pushing out other people, and you know, I mean, I see. I have seen people in the West Village where I lived when I was young. I lived in that neighborhood when I was young because it was cheap. Right. It, now, here's what you see. Range Rovers, golf mm-hmm. clubs. And I think, is this Greenwich Village or Greenwich, Connecticut? Oh, my goodness. And now it's Greenwich, Connecticut. It is. So Do you think- I think that's, that sensibility, you know, is very bad, you know, for thinking, for sure. You know, the truth is that once people have children... They should move. From New York. You know, I know this is going to be horrible. People are going to be really angry at me. And I even know these people who have children. But, (laughs) (coughs) you know, I just... Because once there's a child anywhere, then the whole environment has to be... About the child. Yeah, it has to be about the child in the sense that it has to be safe for the child. Yes. A safe environment for a four-year-old is not the same thing as an adequately safe environment you know, for a 25-year-old right, or a 20-year-old. And so people who have are worried about the environment not being safe for their four-year-olds should go live somewhere where everyone else cares about that because I don't. Right. <laughs> right. I, I wonder if it's these, um, this, um, you know, when we talk about the, the, you know, the make America great again thing, make America great again, and these phrases and this, this attachment to this sort of warped, nostalgic idea of the past, do you think that has something to do with the suburbification of New Because it seems like there's so many people here who are trying to live a life in the center of Brooklyn um, that I grew up with for a fraction of the cost in Indiana, sort of the thing that I came here to get away from, that's what they're trying to do here. Is it? Yeah, that's correct. Is they it, are trying to do it. I, but I don't think that's the same thing as make America great again. Right. That's political. Mm. You, know, and there's, you know, the thing about nostalgia is that uh, it's almost always false, by mm-hmm. which I mean, you know, the thing people are yearning for never existed. Mm. Um, and it... It, there's nothing more poisonous to the culture than nostalgia. Mm-hmm. If you separate the culture from the society, as I do, and I don't think other people do very often, but, right. you know, which and, the, and I think it's very important to, to separate those two things because what you see all the time is artists or people who think they're artists, despite the fact that I think they're entertainers, mm-hmm. um, constantly talking about, you know, I'm doing this and this is going to, you know, this thing which is something that is, uh, a facet of entertainment or perhaps occasionally of actual art, um, and that this is going to improve, you know, the uh, society, which is the political situation. Mm. And, you know, I think that is just not the case, you know, and I don't think that the, that the culture cannot make up for society, period. You have way too much democracy in the culture. Mm. By which I mean every single person in the country thinks they're some kind of artist. Um, and you have way not enough democracy in the society, which is people have no political power. They have no economic power. And that is a society. 
And that is separate from the culture, you know, in the sense of one person, what they're doing. Right. So, you know, that nostalgia in the culture is horrible, which is why you have so little new. You know, there's so little really new. For someone my oh, yeah. age to be complaining all the time that people who are young are not doing things new is really unnatural. I should be saying, what is yeah. this crazy <laughs> stuff these kids are doing? Right. I shouldn't recognize every single thing they're doing because I saw it before 80 million times. You, you know, know, I should be like thinking, I don't like this because it's new. Not, I don't like this because it's old. I don't mind not liking things. Right. I mind not liking them for the, for the wrong reason. One of the things that I've been thinking about a lot lately, um, as somebody who tries to be involved online or can't, like I'm very much involved online, and I've started to retract because what I'm noticing is that having any sort of a, um, a visible persona or a visible voice online where people see your name and then they have all this information behind your name is that people start to expect you to think for them. And I feel like when I was reading um, the books that you wrote, when I was watching um, talks that you've given before, the questions that came to you and the level of engagement, people were critical of you and critical of your thoughts and wanted to be in conversation with you with those criticisms. I'm not seeing as much of that today. I see people just sort of wanting to find the people that they agree with and follow those people and think, well, if that person says this is the right way to do it, then I know I agree with that person in general, so they must be right, and I'm not going to interrogate that anymore. How do you think, can we go back from that? I'd really like to come back to a time where conversations, where people are critical of my thoughts, included them being actually critical of my thoughts. I don't know because I do not have a computer. <laughs> I don't have a phone. I don't have, I don't know what else you're supposed to have. I don't have any of these things. So um, I, I know that I have a presence online because mm -hmm. people constantly talk to me in the street about it or they show me stuff on the phone, but I don't put any of that stuff out there. Right. So, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not certain that it was ever true that people enjoyed being criticized. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think it's very unlikely that people enjoy being criticized. Uh, from what I can surmise, there's no lack of criticism on the Internet. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 what I think is, uh, here's what, I think that people have, it's human nature to want to be with people that you are like. Right. That is one of the unfortunate aspects of human nature, I can't think of a fortunate aspect, aspect of human nature, by the way. Mm -hmm. So it used to be that you got that from your family or your religion or your town because people didn't used to move around so much. Right. You know, so people, people lived in the same towns for generations. Uh, and so people felt comfort in that. Since that is no longer the case, you know, I mean, it's certainly largely not the case. Yeah. then people's opinions, you know, uh, have to substitute for that. And that's what you see what is essentially a kind of tribalism, right. you know, politically, artistically, um, in every possible way, you know. And that is not something um, new. That's something really old. It's old stuff that's dangerous, not new stuff. When Donald Trump was uh, campaigning, mm -hmm. I mean, in the actual campaign as opposed to his constant campaigning, mm -hmm. but during the campaign before the election, I, when I first saw those rallies, I said to friends of mine, these are Klan rallies. Right. This is something I never expected to see again, certainly not in presidential election. Okay? So, and that, I believe very profoundly, is the appeal of Donald Trump. Even I thought there's no way that it could still be this bad. Well, what I thought was, I mean, since the so-called election, mm -hmm. um, mm. you know, when you see, and you, like, if you were not one of those people, mm -hmm. you knew, and if you were from New York, and you knew who Donald Trump really was, which was this cheap hustler, you know, you, you thought to yourself, the people who are voting for Donald Trump, the people who are at these rallies, mm -hmm. um, are not going to be people who profit from whatever Donald Trump does, because that's only going to be very rich people, and you knew that if you weren't one of those people. Right. And that the fact that they continue to support him, it, to 
to me, shows something that I find somewhat startling, mm -hmm. that it is so pleasurable to these people to be able to express overtly their racism that they're happy to give up everything else, including a way to make a living. Yes. Yes. You know, but, but it is a dying thing. It is a dying thing. That is for sure. If you take the subway in New York and you sit in the subway car, which I unfortunately do frequently, although more often stand in the subway car, mm -hmm. and I look around at the people in the subway car with a gun to my head, I could not tell you what race a lot of these people are. Right. Because in a city, which is where people should live, <laughs> in cities where you have tons of different people coming in all the time, eventually people get all mixed up. Right. And that is what you see in New York. And that is what you see, uh, you know, in actual cities. And that is why New Yorkers are, they're not that New Yorkers are better morally. It's that New Yorkers are something that you never hear anymore. They're tolerant. Mm -hmm. By which I mean, you don't have to love other people. I don't care what you feel. Right. It doesn't matter what people feel. It matters how people behave. I really like that you say that because I do wonder if in a lot of these conversations that we've had post-election um, of Trump, we've talked so much culturally about empathy, and I keep thinking, no, no, I don't need anybody to feel a certain way. I need people to do the right thing, and that's, that's right. decency. You need people to behave correctly. Yes. Who cares what they feel? Yes. You, I sit in a subway car, and across from me is sitting a young woman wearing a headscarf. Mm -hmm. Standing next to her is a Hasid, okay, or what regular Jews like me call the crazy Jews. Now, if you ask these people, do you like this girl in the headscarf? If you could get an answer out of these guys, if they would respond to a woman talking to them, which they would not, I assure you, mm -hmm. um, they would probably, if they were honest, say no. If you ask this woman, do you like this guy next to you? this Jewish guy, she probably would say no. But you know what? They are next to each other in the subway, and they get off the subway, and there's no bloodshed. That's true. Every day. And that is the most you can hope from human beings who are really not a fantastic species. One of the things that I read is that you felt really bad about being wrong <laughs> about uh, Trump being elected. More than bad. And I, and I just keep thinking, you know, uh, more of us should be allowed to be wrong publicly, but we also have to be held accountable for those wrong opinions. And I think that, you know, you going into the world and having people say, you were wrong, you know, like, yeah, that's what happens when you say something publicly. Not only was I wrong about Donald Trump, you know, I mean, obviously I was wrong. Um, uh, you know, I, I was so wrong. I, I mean, I didn't just say, well, who knows? I spent the year before the election going around the country, speaking to thousands of people, saying, however many times I said it, zero chance. He has zero chance of winning. And I said that because I believed it, not because I was hoping that would be the case. Right. I, I, it's not that I didn't know there were a lot of stupid people in the country. I didn't know they were that stupid and that there were that many. Mm. No, I didn't know that. And guess what? I'm happy not to know that. I'm glad I didn't know that. Look, at white, straight men my age, they, the whole world was handed to them. Handed to them. I mean, I used to say, if you're a straight, white, Gentile man and you're not the president of the United States, you have failed. <laughs> That's how easy life is for those guys and was for those guys. Right. Now, there's still plenty of these guys alive, mm -hmm. okay? And the fact that, no, they don't get every single thing now, they're furious. Yes. Okay, however, they're not going to last forever. It's it true. seems like forever, but they're not going to last forever. One of the things that I feel, and especially in this conversation, you seem so ready to relinquish power. In a I don't have way. any power, so it's not hard for me to relinquish it. Right. <laughs> okay, if I was on the Supreme Court, my dream, um, I would not be relinquishing it. <laughs> You'd okay? be holding on. So it's very, it's, it's like being bankrupt in 1970. You know, if you don't have any money, you don't care if the city's bankrupt. You know? <laughs> right. Um, so that uh, I don't have any power because in this country, there's only two kinds of real power, and that is money, and that is political power, and now they're almost exactly the same thing, and that is what's wrong. I feel like that's very clear. Why is that such a blind spot for so many people? Is it because they think one day they'll be rich? Yes. It's because 
there's two reasons. One, there's no competing values to money anymore. Mm-hmm. There used to be, I promise you. Look, Americans always loved a buck, okay? Mm-hmm. But there were competing values. In other words, there were other things that were considered equally important to mm-hmm. money. Many other things. All right, for instance, when I was young, no one remembers this but me, even people who are older than me, mm-hmm. it was illegal for lawyers and doctors to advertise. And let me assure you that during that time, there was no such thing as a lawyer joke. Lawyers were respected. They weren't allowed to advertise because <clears throat> that was a profession, law, wow. not a business. So <clears throat> that now there are lawyer jokes because lawyers, you know, they're crooks. Let's face it. <laughs> you know, um, doctors, you know, are mm-hmm. you know, doctors weren't allowed to to. Uh, uh, own stock, even stock in a drug company. Right. Okay, these things were separate. They were separate for a reason because of the despoiling that happens when you put money into certain areas of life. Yes. So, you know, yes, a business, you know, is a, is a way, is, is uh, uh, not is a way to make money, and that's all it is. Mm-hmm. But now, business, businesses are constantly telling you this is our mission. These are our beliefs. Yes. You know, this is what we believe in. This is, and I think you're a business. You sell coffee. I don't care what you believe in. <laughs> How about believing uh, that coffee shouldn't cost five dollars? Right. I believe that. <laughs> okay. I know that coffee doesn't cost five dollars. Okay. You just charge five dollars for it. Yes. So since you charge five dollars for the coffee, I know what you believe in. <laughs> you believe in that's the what dollar. you believe in. Oh yeah. Five dollars for the coffee. Well, that's the new thing they say now. You shop your values. Yeah, well, I don't, okay? Uh So I know that money in politics could be gotten out of politics by laws, Mm -hmm. but not if the laws are being made by the money. Yes. In other words, of course, it's absurd that this is allowed. Right. It is, by its very nature, corrupt. It is already corruption before the first corrupt thing is done. Of course it's corrupt. It's like rich people running for office. I would never vote for one. I would never vote for a rich person running for office ever, and I never have, because rich people don't understand life as it is lived by almost everyone else. I can agree with you there. We used to have different kind of rich people. Okay? So we had, for instance, as a district attorney of New York, almost my entire life, Robert Mm Morgenthau. All right? I mean, almost in my entire life, I only remember... Three district attorneys. That's how long he was the DA in in, in Manhattan. He was a rich man. He was a public servant. I mean, he's still alive, but he doesn't, you know, he's just not the district attorney anymore. He's Mm -hmm. quite an old man. He took a dollar a year. Everyone knew he was a rich man. He was a fantastic DA. He was a really fantastic DA. That kind of rich person doesn't exist anymore. Or if they do, it's Robert Morgenthau, who's just still alive. You know, so that I don't want to hear. You know, when Michael Bloomberg was the mayor, and I loathe Michael Bloomberg, and I continue to loathe him, and if he runs for the president, I continue to loathe him. Mm-hmm. Yet he probably will run for the presidency because one thing we really need is another old rich man. Yes. And he kept saying, you know, and people said about him, oh, it's great to have uh, Michael Bloomberg, a rich man like that, for the mayor because then he doesn't have to take money from anyone. Mm-hmm. So he's he's not corrupt. And I said... He's corrupt. He gives money to people. Yep. Corruption <laughs> runs both ways. If someone takes yep. money, someone gives it. Yep. So that any real opposition to Michael Bloomberg was paid off. You know, you're really going to oppose me on this? You might be able to succeed? Maybe your son would like a job. <sighs> you know, I mean, these kind of things, that, that's what rich people do. That's how they use their money. And philanthropy, this kind of philanthropy you have now, mm-hmm. you know, because you because we allow people to make billions of dollars, which is absurd. Oh, yeah. Uh, no. How about this? Don't set up some sort of, you know, uh, philanthropy. Mm-hmm. Instead, pay your taxes. Wow. Pay your taxes, and then we, the people, will spend that money. A novel idea, because they do not pay taxes. No, of course they don't. <laughs> they do they not don't pay, pay their taxes. taxes. And instead of paying their taxes so that public schools would have money, they, they don't. They set up charter schools, which are a horrible idea. One of the most reviled groups of people in the country are public school teachers. Yes. 
I can hardly think of a more blameless, important group of people than public school teachers. Oh, yeah. Why are they hated? They have unions. Yep. You know, the union busting that the Democrats did. Did you vote for Hillary? I voted for Hillary Clinton, yes. I did. I mean, when people, of course I voted for Hillary Clinton. Yes. I mean, if you're asking did I vote for Hillary Clinton um, and not Bernie Sanders, yes, I voted for Hillary Clinton and not Bernie Sanders. The only time in my life I've ever been booed by my own audience, by which I mean when I do speaking engagements and people Mm -hmm. are coming just to see me alone, they pay to see me. Usually they like you, otherwise they're not paying to see you. I've been booed in my life if I'm on a stage with lots of other people and people came to see them. (laughs) But if people come to see me, they're usually not booing me. I was booed every single night during the campaign because when people would say, what do you think of Bernie Sanders? I would say, I don't like him. The whole audience booed me. Wow. I don't like Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders (coughs) is a small-time guy, very bad on guns, I'd like to point out, Mm. If you care about guns, which I do, mm-hmm. you know, who is the senator from Vermont? Why would that person be a good president if you are 18 years old and someone says college should be free? Then, of course, you love them. And by the way, I think college should be free, too. But explain how that would be possible. Yes. I am absolutely, school should be free. I agree. Yes. College should be free. Of course it should be free. Right. But that means taxpayers pay for it. Yes. It's not free. Yes. So taxpayers pay for it. Guess what? Take the 80 zillion percent of my income that goes to taxes and send people to school with it. I spent a night on an aircraft carrier, the John F. Kennedy, the night, the the last night before it was decommissioned. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of young women sailors on the aircraft carrier. And I asked every single one of them, why did you join the Navy? And every single one of these kids said, so I could get money to go to school. Mm. And I thought, this is insane. Why don't we just send them all to school? Then we don't have to buy them an aircraft carrier. I agree. I agree with you. Fran Leibowitz, thank you so much for your time and for having this conversation. I do hope that I get to speak to you sometime again in the future. Until then, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You have a great day. Bye. Bye.